Welcome to The Derivative by RCM Alternatives, where we dive into what makes alternative investments go, analyze the strategies of unique hedge fund managers, and chat with interesting guests from across the investment world. Happy 7-7, July 7th, 177 days till the end of the year. I halfway want to go through all the famous sevens in sports, Mickey Mantle, Ronaldo, Elway, Bork, but we'll save that for another day. Speaking of halfway through the year, that means we'll be doing our annual Managed Futures ranking soon. Uh, be sure to find that under our white paper section on the website, and we'll follow that up with getting some of those top-ranked managers here on the pod, so stay tuned for that. On to this episode, the inflation-fueled commodity rally has seemed to have lost some speed. And one of the first markets we saw that in was cotton, which dropped more than 30% in a few short weeks. Move over Dr. Copper, because canary cotton is signaling a recession. Why does cotton play a role in the global economy? Where is it grown? How is it hedged? We're walking in some high cotton with Ron Lawson of Logic Advisors and the RCM Ag Group to cover all this and more. Send it. This episode is brought to you by the Hedged Edge Podcast. I've been working with Jeff Eisenberg for over 20 years, and he hosts the Hedged Edge by our RCM Ag Group, where they cover all things ag, growing it, hedging it, marketing it, with guests like Ron here on our pod today. Check it out by searching for the Hedged Edge on your favorite podcast platform. And now, back to the show. All right, so we're here with Ron Lawson, going to talk some cotton. How are you, Ron? Good, how are you doing? I'm great. And where are you? We talked a bit about where you are, but it looks like you're in some California rolling blackouts there. Did you turn off all the lights? No, nah, we've got, uh, just for the back glare, we've, we've knocked it down. The um, Yeah, we're just north of San Francisco in, uh, in the Sonoma, the wine country. I uh, When I was, uh, in my younger years, I ran Merrill Lynch Futures, everything west of the Mississippi. And when uh, we got wind that Merrill might get out of the brokered business and stick to derivatives, uh, I moved up here to the wine country. I figured if you're going to shoot me, shoot me someplace nice. <laughs> and sure enough, they got out of the business. I took it private. And, uh, so that's my, you know, that's, that's how we are in business today was, uh, you know, moved out of LA and moved up here and seems like we're still on vacation. I love it that that was a territory, everything West of the Mississippi. It's a hell, it's a hell of a territory. Yeah. Yeah. There was, um, what, 126 brokers in, uh, 25 different offices. And we set up, we had set up different, you know, I ran the cotton desk for the firm and then we had a cattle desk and wheat desk, et cetera. So it was a good process. It made sense. But one of the things that uh, as derivatives were coming along, Merrill realized that the brokers were, were you know, basically driving the boat. Mm -hmm. and they didn't like that as a, uh, as a management style. So they, they got out of the brokered business, stuck with the derivative side and uh, you know, the rest is history. The, and what do you mean by the derivatives? They'd rather do over the counter, Swap swaps. Yeah, there was a, a real strong sense on the capital market side, uh, driven by a certain individual at the firm, who later was uh, on Interpol's most wanted list for some big uh, energy market problems uh, involving offshore oil contracts and deals that are, you know, pretty nefarious. Anyway, really? that's all behind us, and it's yeah, gone. Let's, and then, you know, let's dive Carol, into that Interpol first. Yeah. First ever mention of Interpol on the derivative podcast here. Yeah, it was uh, it was interesting period of time where uh, you know Merrill Lynch, prior prior to the global financial crisis, we always thought would buy Bank of America to build up the banking side, and it turned around with the GFC, Bank of America bought Merrill. <laughs> so, right. and oh well. In the meantime, all of us had gotten all of the brokers, all the commodity guys had gotten away from Merrill Lynch futures and. Uh, and we all gone out on our own. And wasn't it Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fenner, and Smith for a while? Right. Was the actual FCM name, I think, on the on the floor? It had changed over time as different iterations had had come through. When I when I was hired, I was hired by Merrill Lynch, and it went through three or four different name iterations: Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fenner, Smith, and then Merrill Lynch Futures. And curious about cotton, and I you mentioned it in in one of your questions here, is that. The firm, Merrill Lynch, started with money from a cotton merchant. Mm. So deeply ingrained within the firm was the, the whole cotton ethos of you know, making and taking delivery, uh, you know, sample rooms and processing in Manhattan. We were, 
we were, you know, we handle about 30% of the volume uh, of the futures trading and options trading back in the day, uh, given the uh, propensity of Merrill Lynch as being a force in the market. I love it. Um, and so we got to give a shout out. We just talked offline real quick. Of Close to your office there is a little great American dive bar called Ernie's Tin Can. Tin Bar. Is, tin tin bar. bar. All right. I want to call it Tin Can. Ernie's Tin Bar. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about that. So the fellow has one of the few uh, alcohol licenses in the state of California where you can serve beer only, just beer. It's left over from the prohibition days he inherited from his grandmother. Uh, they can't serve wine or hard alcohol. Uh, but to the bonus side, you know, kids can be in there. It's not a, it's not a like a, a hardcore dive bar somewhere in the bad part of town. It's right out in the countryside, in between uh, grapevines and uh, sheep. Uh, you know, out in the sheep, sheep fields. And Ernie has, I think it's on the order of 40 or 50 different beers on tap, all high end, good stuff. And uh, because of its proximity to the uh, Sonoma Raceway, where they hold NASCAR, they get a lot of different traffic from a lot of different uh, types of folks, locals, travelers, uh, visitors. It's a, it's a cool local place. And their big rule is if you use your cell phone, you got to buy the house around. I love it. They're strict with that. So uh, I got a picture here. I'll show if those yeah. on YouTube can see the picture. You're literally in the garage. Right. And you can pull up some stools under some tires there and uh, have a beer. And it was great after the wines in Napa. So, yeah, you know, it takes a lot of cold beer to make good wine. <laughs> That's what I the wine say. <laughs> So before we dive into just how all this cotton stuff works, let's talk about how cotton was one of the first commodity markets to really sell off over the last couple of weeks. Um, yeah. Falling from a high of 154 ish in early May. 158. The 158 down into the low 90s. So it lost, you know, more than a third of its value. Yeah. We're at 80, 89 and change right now. Just to, to show how we got to where we were back in 2020 when COVID shut down everything. Uh, Macy's, we use this as a, as a marker, a mile marker. Macy's closed its doors, COVID shut down, boom. Less than 48 hours later, we had our cotton warehouse customers in Georgia receive cancellation orders on shipping bales of raw cotton overseas to be spun and converted into goods. That's how fast the pipeline impacted. Wow. Less than 48 hours. Okay, from there, the market bottomed 48 cents and change. Um, we then noticed some dynamics within the global marketplace where the pipeline had drained so quickly that the mills were starting to concern themselves about, well, with supply chain problems, how do we get our cotton? So we started to see interest at the consumption level that, that is very difficult to quantify. When we talk to a lot of uh, funds, they, what they try and do is they try and they want everything on a spreadsheet to put in an algorithm. And you yeah. can do that on the supply side, uh, count bales, count acres, abandonment, uh, what are yields, you know, we, we can figure out, we can count supply side. Demand side is, is, is absolutely mercurial. You've got all kinds of emotional efforts that push and pull at the retail level, at the wholesale level, at the, at the, at the people that die, that cut, that weave, that spin. There's so much of that unknown and, and it's not, they don't act in concert. They don't have their own individual uh, drivers. So we started to see the demand side come and we got, and we looked at some, you know, technicals, we follow very closely that. And then there's a pattern that I've noticed in the cotton market. I'm doing this 40 years and I've got a long-term book going back to the 1930s on the charts. And I found, and I have found that every major bottom, 100% of the time, every major bottom in the cotton market adheres to this certain pattern on the weekly continuation chart. And we formed it and we called everybody and said, look, you know, this is the technical thing. It's there. It's uh, 100% over the last, you know, since 1941, we had a bottom. Don't be short. And that was our, that was our play. Don't be short. Now, you don't, a lot of guys would rather not have a position and being flat is a position and that's okay. But we just, we got everybody out of the short side of the market. And then we had this nice run. Okay. Things running. It's going great. Goes to a buck 58. 
we started back in May of hearing the mills, the same mills that were panicking for supply starting, you know, these are our clients. We talk to them regularly and they were starting to complain that the apparel uh, companies they dealt with were feeling uh, inventory buildup and we're starting to ease back on their orders, asking for delayed shipments, cutting back on, you know, uh, they'll have a contract. We want this much with an option for more. All those options went away. Mm. Okay. And where they really started to get uh, panicky was the, during the supply chain problems that had built up during COVID, they were ordering two and three, four times the amount of cotton they needed because they weren't sure who could get it to them from which country. Was it Brazil? Was it China? You know, India? Where you at? Where we? And all of a sudden, just as the apparel pushback came, here shows all the cotton. Mm -hmm. So now their opening rooms are full. Their spinning schedules are down. They're running at 65, 70% of capacity. They're laying off people. And so we start hearing this panic in their voice. And what we tried to get across to our clientele was, look, everyone's focusing on the demand side, on the, sorry, on the production side, on the supply, because there's drought in, in, in Texas, and that's still an issue. Uh, I met with a group of Brazilian farmers that represent 60% of their production on a, on a trip from Bear, Monsanto. And they were telling us that their crop is three to 4 million bales less than the USDA flooding on half of the Australian crop. Uh, you know, they're, they're down there har trying to harvest amidst, amidst the flood. So everyone's focusing on the supply side, but because the demand side is so mercurial, it's very hard to say, okay, you know, raise a flag. There's a problem. But we saw the problem and we saw it not just in the spinning mills that were making great headway during COVID, those being the ones that didn't have to send product over water into Northern Europe. You know, they were, they were printing money because they didn't have a supply chain problem. Hmm. And all of a sudden they, they were getting pushed back. So we put all our clients on, on notice. Look, uh, we know there's a supply side uh, problem. Uh, but no, the demand side is really, really sick. And so we called in everyone and, and, and put out the word and, uh, you know, very vocal in our writing. We write a letter every day. As I explain it to you, you know, when you inhale and exhale cotton every day, you know, someone who checks in with you once a month and wants to know what it smells like. It's like, hey, come on, you know, read the letter. We put it out every night. <laughs> and I believe, and this is, this is one of our long held theories that Cotton is one of the longest leading economic indicators and best indicators that there is. And it's for the simple reason that from conception to consumption, it's the longest commodity. It takes more, it takes 12 to 18 months from the time you plant, you know, prep the soil for the seed till you buy a pair of Levi's at the store. Hmm. And along that way, you got to consider what's the, what's the cost of land, the rent, uh, what's the fertilizer, pesticide, herbicide? You got to buy water, labor, diesel for your tractor, go through the field three or four times, grow the crop, harvest the crop. Now you got to gin it. It's not like you harvest corn, put it in a silo, use it. No, nope. you got to take it, get the fiber off the, off the seed, take the bales, store them, cost of insurance, cost of carry, ship them from the raw cotton bales into thread, thread to be woven, thread to be put into you know, fabric, be cut, to be sewn, to be dyed, wholesale to retail, retail shipped back to the U.S. and put on the shelf. So over that period of time, you have exposure to pretty much every macroeconomic factor that exists. And so as a barometer of what's happening in the global economic world, cotton is a hell of a good tool. And it tells us that this drop is probably portending some, you know, we are in recession. Well, this, is, this, is, yeah. this is the proof of it. So that was my, that was going to be my first question. Was this a cotton specific thing or a macro thing? If we're going into recession, this is the Fed's going to, um, you know, kill the economy, put us in recession, sell your cotton. Or you're saying yeah. it, was, it was sort of both. I think cotton started to react to it uh, innately prior to the Fed. But once the Fed did raise rates, it kind of put a dagger in the heart to the market. And you saw cotton broke before the other markets did. Yeah. And, and again, well, I wanted to have you on. Tell us why that is. Yeah. It's simply because all of the people that have their fingers in the pie, whether they're 
cognizant of or not, uh, have an effect on the price of the market, right? I mean, at the end of the day, and nobody knows anything more about the market than the market itself. What did it close at? What were people willing to buy or sell cotton on, a, on the market's close every day? That, that tells you what it's worth. And when we started to see the demand side go away, it's one of the old lines in the cotton market. I don't care how small the crop is. If there's nobody there to buy it, the prices are going down. Yeah. That's, that's what we're faced with here. So we had no buying from the, from the consumer. The, selling from the producer side, the normal hedge selling from the producer side wasn't there simply because they didn't know what their crop is going to be in Texas, for instance, uh, where, you know, you would expect to be 7 million acres, six to 7 million acres planted. It's only, you know, they had that planted, but this year because of the drought, they're not going to harvest. They're going to have a 50% abandonment. Now, Ironically, this is going to be one of the best years for cotton farmers in Texas ever, of all time. And the reason is, when they plant cotton, they buy insurance, and they get 10 days for emergence. So you plant it on the 1st, and if on the 11th the seed hasn't come up, you get your insurance check for non-emergence. And there's different areas of the, of the state where different times of planting come optimally. But generally, by the time you get to June 30th, all of the optimal planting dates have come and gone plus 10 days. All the insurance has been paid for and you start to get the guys just writing off the acres. So here's the dynamic. The insurance rates are based on the previous year's price, which this year equated to a dollar three, which for cotton is a hell of a price. Yeah. Okay? I almost say take the insurance and don't right. put in the work, right? Precisely. 70 cents cost of production, then it's now over a dollar because of fuel costs and all, but fertilizer. But so here, these guys went out and planted every, every field they could and bought insurance on it. And now they're going to get a dollar three per pound based on their average historical yield. Okay. No input cost, no cost of water, no fertilizer, no pesticide, no diesel. But they so still have to plant it. Well, they get to put the seed in the ground. Got it. But so what does that look like? Is I don't want to get anyone in trouble, but do they kind of mail it in? Right. If you know you're going to do that, do you just do your minimal effort to put the seed? in? Yes. The yeah. In fact, the, the, the cultural practices were, um, you know, I'm not pointing the finger at anybody. No, no. Insurance for 50 years as a farmer and the one year you get to collect or okay. Yeah, true. Normally you drill seed in with as minimal, the, the least amount of topsoil disturbance to trap moisture. Well, what they did this year is they opened up the bed, they dropped the seeds in, and then they dusted over it. So all the moisture escaped, mm. what little was there. So here these guys are going to get $1.03 a pound based on historical yields. The seed also has a rebate value. So about $0.07 cents a pound for that. So they're about $1.10 is what it works out. But, and then all of our customers, we had purchased puts. Real quick on that, but they're not, they're buying this insurance or it's just government yeah. provided? No, they buy it from the government. It's the government. Okay, program. but they have to actually purchase it. Right. I think right. that's a little unknown, right? When people see the billions of dollars that go in farm subsidies, mm. right? So there are two things there. There's subsidies and there's government sponsored insurance. So you have to buy right. into the insurance. You got the buy subsidies insurance. are just extra if they pass a Yeah, those a are all based on, when you go back to the CCC was developed in, in, in trying to ensure that we had proper amounts of commodities produced and you know you can go get into that political historical agricultural division yeah. this is just on insurance for your crop crop okay. insurance you pay for so every year you buy it and this one year they get to use it so here they come along they've owned puts we, we got them all what we did is we would we have a program where we own puts for the growers and every time the value of their crop goes up two cents and in, in this case you know eight cents we would roll the put up for 400 points 400 strikes so they're getting two for one every time we rolled they made yeah. double their investment okay and if you get 100 percent return on your investment that's a pretty good deal right so we got them up to a buck and a quarter the market collapses so now they're sitting on you know 25 to 30 cents worth of profit on a crop that, that does not exist and there's no government regulation that you have to actually no. Right. That you can earn money from a hedge on a crop that didn't exist. They took the risk of the hedge. Their bankers financed them. Yeah. You know, all programs we set up. 
So in the end, the farmers are going to make a buck 30, buck 40 on a historical yield with zero input cost. Hmm. Now, what most of them are going doing now that the crop yeah, and what's in up, Texas, the average over the last 10 years is 50 cents or something like what was the what's the uh, comparison? Yeah, normally you're 65 to 70 cents is a good year for them. And, you know, they'll do normally two bales to the acre. You know, this is both dry land and irrigated combined. And even the irrigated crop didn't come this year because the it's normally an irrigated supplement. So you use the rain from the sky, obviously, for irrigation. You supplement with irrigation. Well, they got no rain. Hmm. So the, the seedlings never really came. They, they sent a taproot down. They found nothing but dust and they died. Guys get a check. The, the number of acres, it could be two to three million acres written off is so large that the insurance guys are what we call, they just tap the table. You know, you show proof of planting and we know that there's been no rain for 25 days. So here, here's your check. Right. So they're not putting in their own input costs. We're not going to spend a whole bunch of money verifying this. Exactly. We know it's bad. And so yeah. what they'll do now is a lot of them, you know, farmers are farmers. They don't like this. They don't want to. Yeah. They'll go to the coffee shop and not work. So a lot of them are coming back with a, with a, they'll go in and dust in some some you know, uh, safflower something that's a very low minimal water requirement seed and just see what happens. Hmm. It, it's basically just to keep the ground together. So, so let me add. It seems like yeah. a weird commodity, right? Because like you're saying, that twelve to eighteen months, it turns into a pair of jeans. Yeah. I don't have to buy a new pair of jeans every month. Like I have to buy food. Right. Or like I have to fill up my car. So it seems like a, in a demand destruction, it doesn't necessarily snap back. Right. So it no, seems it, like it's not always needing, needing to be replenished. So it's that kind of what drives the tie into macro of like, it's is, kind of a, it's not yeah, a perishable good, right? No, it's not. And, and there's, there's an interesting dynamic when you look at it, uh, the utility of cotton, uh, it, it depends on which end of the cycle you're talking about. You're talking about, you know, basic, uh, T-shirts, socks, underwear versus, you know, paying $80, $90 for a dress shirt, okay? Yeah. We find it fairly inelastic at the low end that people can, you know, continue to need to consume, which is why you see blends coming in when it's very, uh, when cotton gets too expensive, you tend to have 100% cotton goes to 90% to 80% to 70% when they, they supplement with, with uh, you know, man-made fiber. The big pushback on that, though, is the microplastics problem in the oceans that's becoming the, what I call it is the millennials DDT. If you remember back when Silent Spring came out and DDT and the weak eggshells and DDT has been banned around the world, you know, I'm not going to get into an argument, but basically, you know, DDT was the biggest um, weapon that a lot of countries Africa had against uh, the TT fly and to the mosquitoes yeah. and banning that it. That was deep. Caused- no ddt got it it's just the off that's the stuff that keeps the mosquitoes off ddt actually kills and the cotton guys are, are, are to blame more than anybody else the triangles killed the bull weevil they use too much ddt and it wrecked the environment and so it's been banned so here we are now finding that uh, some studies claim that in, in any given year you at this point each human consumes microplastic over a period of year equivalent to eating a credit card mm. and they found it in the bloodstream of uh, yeah i've seen it like the deepest eating. deep ocean right thing they pulled up had microplastics in it. so what we're seeing is a pushback against uh man-made fiber and people are preferring the natural fibers it's not just cotton it's you know it's hemp it's silk it's uh you know other man-made fibers that biodegrade at a micro level where the plastics do not so that's one of the big pushbacks that we're and seeing. And the plastics require fossil fuels, right? They, pr- they require do require oil. Yeah, they, they come from from that's that's one of the strain, and that's why when you saw the you know oil prices go up, the price of polyester goes up. So it, it also retarded a bit of that consumption. So here we are, you know. But I'm uh, guess it's almost like a not quite a luxury good, but it's like a thing that if if I have to choose, I'm going to go buy my family food versus a new new clothes, right? Right. So and that, like analysis, that might be some of the reason why it turns over first. Yes. And, and what we've tried to explain in, in, in our analysis is that we continue to get information. Oh, look at retail sales. They're doing great. You know, look at it. But they're talking about dollar sales, not unit cost. Mm-hmm. Right. So if the prices go up and the sales go up, but your unit costs are high, the, the consumption, the tonnage 
one of the things this this is fascinating that, that that during COVID, when people went from wearing dress shirts, silk ties, and you know suits, wool suits, they went to staying at home and wearing heavier you know, hoodies and sweats, and and the consumption of cotton went way up because the clothing that was required for a hoodie, the amount of cotton required for that is eight or nine times that of a dress shirt. And they want to be comfier, more want, cotton, the comfort, more comfortable it is. Right. So we have to, we, we, the fashion sense is that we look at the tonnage consumed, not the, you know, not the, the cost to it. So we had lower cost goods that had higher relative percentages of cotton within them and heavier growth, heavier tonnage. So we had a, a renaissance in consumption, which is now gone. Now, if people can't afford food and, and, and energy, they can't go to work and they can't buy gas, they're not going to be buying clothing. They've got all they need for now. So that's another reason why we saw that apparel back up into the mill sector that sent the alarm up for us. Yeah, and that was, everyone kind of passed over that of like inventories are building up. It was kind of right. like this, that was everything, right? Toys and bikes. Right. You couldn't get a bike, now you can get a bike. Now there's they, too many, yeah. you couldn't yeah. get patio furniture, now there's too much patio furniture. So let's back up a little bit and talk more on the, the physical side kind of uh, or the big overview of like who has the cotton, like which countries, where is it going, which other countries. Um, you kind of blew my mind in the beginning there. You're saying we a lot of it's grown in America, basically goes somewhere in Asia, I would assume, to get turned into clothing and then shipped back to America. Yeah, the, I, I always think back when when I first started in the industry, you know, the U.S. produced roughly, just to use the number, 20 million bales. We spun domestically 17, 16 million and shipped three or four million. Today, we only consume two and a half to three million domestically. All of it else, is, all the rest of it's exported. So the three biggest players are India, China, the U.S. And each one has its own challenges. In the U.S., we produce cotton for the export market. Um, do, cotton is priced in dollars around the world, so we are a little sensitive to exchange rates here um, you know, as far as customers go. China, biggest producer and consumer of cotton. Uh, they do have an issue that is existing right now. We've been talking about it for a number of years, and that's the human rights problems in the Xinjiang province where they produce most of the cotton. The, the global apparel industry has turned its back on China for any products made from Xinjiang fiber or made in Zingyan. So what they've had to do is any cotton there, and that's their major 80% of their production is there. They've had to use that domestically only and then import bales to be converted and re-exported. And they still have a very vibrant textile industry. And just last night, we are hearing from China that their, their strategic reserve, which they, they, they wore down, they're going to refill it, but not with as much with uh, imported cotton. They're going to use Zingyan. So in the near term, that's a negative because they won't be buying imp as much imported cotton from the U.S. and India and, you know, Brazil and China and uh, Australia. They'll refill with their domestic. But that just means there's that much more demand down the road for yeah. imported cotton. And the U.S. is their is one of their favorite cust uh, customers. And, and do you ever even believe in when they say that? Part of me thinks they say that drive down the price and then buy. Right. And. And stock they're, really the, good at that. they're really good at that, which is why we talk to our people in China who are actually doing the buying. Yeah. To find out when it's, you know, which lie is true, basically. <laughs> so China, China is, you know, a big, a big drain on the world market now, and they will remain that way. We're a little concerned on the finance side in China. You know, 25% of their GDP is real estate, which is getting beat up badly. Yeah. You know, when the old line, China gets a cold, you know, China sneezes, the world catches cold. Okay, we got to watch that. Um, the next one's India. India is a, a big producer and consumer. Uh, they've just gone through a renaissance in their seed. Uh, normally, what, what they used to, when you buy cotton seed that's genetically modified to be resistant against pesticides and herbicides, they've just allowed that into uh, genetically modified seed into India. What they were doing before was what they call brown bag. I harvest my crop, I take the fiber, the lint I sell, and I hold that seed and I replant that next year. But over generations, you get a degradation of both yield and quality. 
So now they're bringing in the good seed and they're starting to come back and really improve. Um, so that India has got a, a bright future, provided that the monsoon shows up and it's all a rain grown crop over there. It's, it's rain grown, it's hand picked. It's a huge difference in the cotton world between irrigated and, and dry land growing, you know, non-irrigated, machine picked and hand picked, huge differences in values and pricing and quality. So India is a big, big, big deal. Um, something that you know that everybody deals with. The one glitch there is that the USDA over the last dozen years, for some reason in their model, continues to claim India has inventories of anywhere from eight to twelve million bales of carry out at the end of the year. Our guys in India who are who are supposedly owning these bales, they don't exist. Hmm. So it's, it's a widely known situation within the cotton industry that the USDA's numbers continue to reflect excess supply in India that really isn't there. Well, the cash market reflects what's really there. So whether the, you're statistically on board or not, it doesn't matter. That, that, that's the thing. So that's India's deep deal. The up and comer now is Brazil, where they can, I was, like I said, I met with the 30 farmers you know, that, that Bayer Monsanto had brought in in San Francisco here last month. And these are guys are, this is 60% of the entire production of cotton in Brazil. And they are hell bent on doubling their production over the coming years. So they're the ones that are big up and comers and it's because they can offset with, with soybeans, right? They can plant one and plant the other, get a double crop in there. Hmm. Their problem is logistics. They, you know, they don't have uh, the rail capacity, the port capacity, the trucking capacity. But they're working on that. And, it, and as an industry aside, this, this happened, this was a decade ago. China in their Silk and Road venture had approached Brazil and said that at China's expense, using China's laborers, they would completely revamp the ports, the rails, and roads of, in, of Brazil as long as China had first right of refusal on all ag products in the country. Okay, sounds like a great deal. Well, Brazil backed away. And, and to their credit, and if you think about it from a, from a global perspective, the last time one country, one sovereign nation decided to help another sovereign nation along those ways was the Panama Canal. Yeah. <laughs> when did some country offer to come in and, oh, we'll take care of you, don't worry, as long as we get ours out. So it, it was a big deal. Brazil backed away. They've made a lot of strides, and I think they're going to be the up-and-comer, uh, you know, in the future so that's, it, that's is that tied to deforestation down there are they planting it in where they're clearing out rainforest right but it's most of it's coming on ground that's already been cleared for soybeans because that's been the big driver we we follow soybeans and cotton and, and just you know again we, we breathe inhale and exhale every day the cost of production the ratio between soybeans and cotton when you distill it to the just to the final end it used to be a 12 to one ratio where at break even was soybean prices 12 times cotton prices. And then when it gets out of whack, you know that it's more profitable to plant one in those areas where you have a choice or the other if it gets out of whack. So it, what we saw you know, here with the soybean market driving prices up over the last year and a half, two years, we were at not 12 to one, but 14 to one, 15 to one. In fact, got to 17 to one at one point where it was way more profitable to plant soybeans. And so we saw cotton kind of fall back from its production side. Now with the yields and the way things have come, the prices come down, we're closer to that traditional 14 to one ratio. So we follow that very closely to give us an idea of what's going to go in the ground. Now, once it's planted, you know, the yeah. ratio doesn't matter, but we, we follow that pretty closely. And so U.S., what's, what all those countries in billions of dollars, right? Like, what does that equal in terms of the right. raw crop being sold? So let's just say that it, over the next 12 months, there's about $55 billion it, with 90, at 90 cents a pound and 121 million bales. That's the production for the season. The next season, which is July to the end of June, is about $55 billion. And so you can logically extrapolate, well, we probably got 55 billion from the, from the current crop, right? Yeah, yeah. So all told, 100 billion, maybe, you know, padded up 120, 130 billion dollars of total raw cotton uh, inventory over a 12 month period. You know, what's in the ground, what's in the bale, what's in the warehouse and opening rooms. And how much of America's gets shipped 
over to Asia to get turned into clothes and shipped back? We are 25% of the world's global consumption at the end user level. We're not that in, so if we're, if we're gonna produce, you know, I'm looking at the WASD numbers here and they're, I've got them here in front of me and they, we're gonna get a next set here coming up, but the US produces, you know, the numbers for the coming year, 16 and a half million bales versus 121 of the world, okay? And our domestic use is only 2.5. So we only spend two and a half million bales of 16 and a half produced. But of all the goods produced in the world, the end user consumption of apparel in the United States is 25%. Wow. So that's we, even greater than their energy, right? That's unbelievable. Right. Yeah. Because we're less than 10% of the population, right? Yeah. We're close, um, close horses here. Yeah. Whoa. Um, that's hard to believe. I was just thinking of we're talking about this. Well, one, it I've never thought of it like this. The cotton, the fluffy pea, that's the flowering part of the seed, I guess. Yeah, like how does it naturally off. reproduce? That will eventually fall off and no, get blown around in the wind. And from within the flower, very much like you know, you'll see a rose develop that hard bud. So you get yeah. that bud of the bowl. Okay. And it's a green pod about the size of a walnut. And then it grows and cotton is actually a perennial plant. If you plant it, it will go dormant in the winter and come back, but we grow it and use it culturally as an annual. Got it. So as the, as it goes in, as we come into the fall, if we get a frost optimal, if not, you use a, a defoliant to shock the plant to drop all its leaves. And then what happens is the plant dries and that green bowl turns brown and then cracks. And out of that will come the lint with the seeds attached. And the harvesting machines come through and what used to be done by hand, picking the bowls, and it's still done in, in some countries, the machines pick the bowls off and they get put into what are now great big round bales, similar to, you see big hay bales with the plastic. Yeah. Them. They take those. And My kids call those marshmallow fields. When right. We're driving past Wisconsin and you see all those white big rolls, yep. they look like huge marshmallows yep. they do and they used to do it in cotton was put uh, modules which looks like huge loaves of bread but that required and that was forever until you know actually the aussies were the ones that, that drove the drove this this trend till about 15 years ago and they required these big trucks to come in and pick up the modules and home now they have these bales and they you know, stick a fork in it put them on the trucks and it's a lot easier to move them they remain in plastic on the gin yard and then they cut the plastic off so the, the rain doesn't hurt it. It goes through the gin, you know, Eli Whitney cotton gin, right? Yeah. Everyone, why was that such a thing in, in grade school, right? Everyone knew about Eli Whitney. And it was, it's, it's amazing. If you, if you go back, if you're an, an agricultural historian, you realize that the production of cotton historically ends up in the country that has the cheapest source of labor, whether that be, human labor, or if you go through time, if you were along a river and had a, a auto yeah. wheel, you could drive it to steam. All right. And then, then you have electricity and, and you just, just over time, you look at the industrial revolution where, where most of the cotton was, you know, grown, processed and harvested. And it all comes back to where's the cheapest labor. Wow. And, and so, so that was the U S colonies for the longest time. Yeah. Right. I mean, you can make a very strong case that our forefathers sitting around a bar in, in Boston said, hey, let's start a country. Well, we can pay for it with this cotton because yeah. England needs it. They want it. We got it. And that was one of the finances that and tobacco with the financing of, of the War of Independence and <laughs> a big component in the Civil War because the cotton was produced in the in the southern states, but all the banking and financing was done in the Yankee northern states. Yeah. And so and that the, was the ultimate. We've touched on a lot of issues here, but right. They had free labor and slavery. So that was a little exactly. painted. But and what were their derivatives markets back then? Were there futures markets or just where was the cotton trading hub? Was always Memphis? It was it started. It was in New Orleans for the cash market. New Orleans used to be if you go back and look at your history, New Orleans was the financial hub of the United States because of the Mississippi River and everything could go to the world. Yeah. When the banking came through and, and ended up in New York City, then all of the financing came from the New York banking for the southern farmers. 
And so whatever they literally, the cotton would have to be harvested, shipped to New York, where it was paid for, and then sent over to Europe for to be used in, in Europe. And again, that was before the, you know, when the cotton gin was invented and then brought back here and then the spinning mills were, you know, the, the, the technology was stolen and brought back to the US and we put it along our waterways and were able to then spin the cotton into, into fabric. So that was a big rubbing point with the South in that, look, we're, we're the ones making all the money and you guys are making money on us. Why should we send it directly to, why don't we just send it directly to, you know, to Europe? And so that must be why the New York Board of Trade, right? The Cotton and Cocoa Exchange was right. they, out of New started, York, which always didn't make quite much sense to me. Sense. They, they, they had a New Orleans Cotton Exchange forever, to, you know, that was there. Then the New York, then you had the co- Cotton Exchange, the Coffee, Cocoa, Cotton, Orange Juice to start out, and then, and then the New York Board of Trade, and then you had, you know, came along. Uh, ice intercontinental exchange and um, that's when everything really changed significantly because you went from a privately held uh, consortium of owners of, of an exchange who stood for the the veracity and the the worth of all yeah to a public company who's you know by law they're they're obligated to make as much as they can it's not so their shareholders the right yeah they're the shareholders so they in the industry, and it's, it's a little cynical, I agree, but they say that the, um, you know, the Chicago markets uh, are commodity markets that utilize uh, technology to be efficient, whereas ICE is a technology company that bought some commodity markets. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> right, and that's a whole other discussion because right, yeah. like the uh, LME canceled all those trades in nickel because, right. hey, they might have had to lay out a lot of money and they're a for-profit exchange. I mean, you, you've been doing this a while. I can remember back when the tin market blew up, when the silver market, well, when you know, I was, you know, when Merrill and the, and the gold market, you know, and the silver market with the hunts and yeah. you know, great stories about that. But it seems in the commodity markets, because they're so leveraged by nature and because they're at the crux of everything. I mean, you know, crude oil is the, you know, the, the crux of energy, uh, food, you know, corn, soybeans, wheat, the crux of food, you know, there's, there's, it's like a gate, you know, we're the, we're the hinge. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can make everything go swizzling in long ways. So who are the big type of commercials who play in this game? Right, there... be, yeah, it used to be ABCD, Allenberg, Bungie, Cargill, Donovan. Now it's a little shifted. Uh, you got, I was making a list here is who the, the people that are, are more involved now you get, um, you know, Cargill, uh, Noble, Ecom, Louis Dreyfus, Olam. And then there's, there's other small, uh, you know, well-known historical companies, Jeff Smith and Sons, uh, Plexus, uh, Reinhardt. Uh, and then you have the co-ops here in, Cal- here in California. We have Calcott. Uh, you have Staple Cotton is another big co-op. And uh, the PCCA, which is in Texas, uh, so those are, those big co-ops do it's, it's very, absolutely the same as it is in a in a grain market where they let the farmers produce and worry about that, and then the co-op takes care of the marketing. So they're the big players as far on the supply side. Yeah, the merchants then are the ones that get it from the growers to the mills, right? And they're the ones that are the the. I always said if. Uh, uh, the merchants are the smartest guys in the pipeline. You know, if you, you give them any rules, they'll figure out how to beat you regardless. Exactly. What you're and that's like Bungie and those kind of guys. Yeah. Noble the big and, yeah. Lewis Dreyfus is the, is the big now, big one. Now Olam is huge and noble. Uh, yeah. Those, those are the big international guys. And we'll throw yeah. out that I never knew until 10 years ago that Julie, Julia Louis Dreyfus right. <laughs> from Seinfeld. That's her family, right? That's her grandfather, yeah. whatever Louis Dreyfus, who's, yeah, billion. I don't know if they're billionaires, but a lot of money, right? Yeah, and there's oh. there's a lot of you know intricacies involved as there is in any market with uh, different issues on different divisions of the company and the personalities involved. And the uh, cotton is such a. I, I look back when I was at Merrill and I was running all the different desks. I'd have to go to the Cattlemen's Association or the 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 scrap scrap dealers association and be a spokesman and everything. And the one thing I noticed about the cotton market 
very specifically was these guys would trade the snot out of each other all day long. I mean, <laughs> in the market, back and forth and up and down the bell rings, had to go get a beer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, it was heavy, heavy competition. But at the end, they were all in it together, which is, you know, they have the American Cotton Shippers Association, AXA. And I was just at the meeting up in uh, Lake Tahoe uh, last week, the annual meeting. And, and we had the uh, new uh, CFTC chairman came and spoke, spoke to us. And, and it's a group that is in place for the betterment of the industry, not for any one company, but for the betterment of the industry. And they will actually make decisions individually that hurt their own firm for the betterment of the industry. And that, that's, it's, it's very unique amongst all the commodity groups. And that's the yeah. cotton guys are that old school. Like you said, that historically they've been around a long time. You know, you have old family traditions, old, old lines that are, you know, nobody steps across. And that's, that's one of the attractive things about cotton. And so the merchants get it to the mills and then the mills are facing off with Levi's or whoever. Yes, you know, it, it's, it's a misunderstanding a lot of the times. It's very much like in the, uh, in the meat packers industry. These guys work on margins, right? So if I'm making a 2% margin on an 80 cent uh, product uh, and the market goes to a dollar, I'm making 2% on a dollar product, right? And yeah, they're yeah. margin oriented. So very risk averse. They, they, they hedge uh, so that, you know. The mills we're talking about. Right, the mills. They yeah. hedge for the most part. They there's a there's a symbiotic relationship between the merchants and the mills where the mills and the merchants buy on call on call is is the term and it's common industry in other in other uh, industries as well it's a common place where i'm i'm the mill you're the merchant i agree to buy a certain amount of cotton from you at a known difference a basis over or under the futures market hmm. and then when i need it i call and say okay fix it at this price okay so that relationship is ongoing and where you see it being stressed as we're going to see here is if guys bought cotton on call and fixed it at a dollar 30 and now we're sitting here at 89 cents they're going to say you know i i i i don't want that yeah no thanks <laughs> so uh what we anticipate and i'm not i'm not in any way saying this disparagingly it's just it's a fact that there's we we we've, we've seen this movie before you know, after 40 years, I've seen this in other markets, I've, and I've absolutely felt it and been involved with it in cotton, where we are going to get arbitrations. Uh, mm. There's going to be significant numbers of arbitrations uh, because mills just, they, they don't have the money. I, 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 can't, I can't pay you that because I can't pay you that. It's not that I don't, I'd like to, but I can't. Right. Like going so, back to your numbers, 60 rounded up, 60 billion is now, the total crop is now only worth 40 billion. Yeah. So, so right. The, if they have to pay out the 60, they're like, I can't, I can't get it. Precisely. So there, there's going to be some disruption coming. That to me, and this gets again a little more esoteric on the concept. That's adding to the angst. You know, oh my God, how bad is this going to get? How bad? How badly will that reflect upon the financial situation? You know, people going bankrupt never hurts an economy. It never helps an economy. Yeah. Right? yeah. So we we see that as 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 a real issue. It's like the un unintended consequences of all these rate raises and we're slowing the economy down Well, you're going to put some people out of business. Right. right. Um, and so that's one of the issues of all that commercial side. What, what are some of the other issues and how do they think about hedging those? So what a lot of the, you know, it, it depends on the sophistication and, and I'll tell you the, uh, again, in the industry, there's a, they put on an event every other year. It's called the USA sourcing summit where uh, buyers of cotton and the people that buy us cotton to be imported overseas or exported from here overseas they come and they they get invited and they get to meet all of the suppliers that the u.s has so all the buyers come together from all over the world and it's been going on for a number of years i you know i'm in the uh, on the bull and bear panel i i help organize different things and one of the things we saw was the bangladesh spinning uh, entity show up here 12 years ago and the spinning is making the clothes, actually. They, yeah, they were buying cotton, and they were really the uh, Bangladeshi government was in, trying to really get that industry building because it hired a lot of people. You can, in, you know, cheap labor, import the stuff easily, and they export it to, you know, to Europe. So they came and they learned how to buy on call. Okay, worked great. Things were super. We had the market go, 
in 2011 up to two dollars and 27 cents and then come back down and ah, they all imploded yeah. so here we are again at a same similar situation i say we've seen this movie before we know how it ends so we're expecting to see a number of, of problems come along that's why we redouble our effort to explain to guys how to use options as opposed to futures or buying fixed price or going on call simply to give you the protection, like the high sleepability factor, but not be obligated to be locked into something. And it's really, it's, I can, the effort must be working because the volatility values have gone up that where, you know, the buying people are more eager to buy than I was willing to sell. And at the same time, we've seen the over the counter, the OTC derivatives come in significantly into cotton. And, uh, you know, the way we see that, you know, they're, they're selling premium, they sell option premium uh, on both sides of the market. And if they do a collar and nothing happens, they keep all the money, you know? So now who's doing that? The banks, um, mostly the commodity banks. We, you know, our, our clientele are not just the producers and the spinners and the merchants, but the commodity banks, hedge funds, uh, money managers, large speculators. We get our fingers on a, on a number of different pulses to f- get a feel for it. And the commodity banks are very eager to be premium sellers because they can take all of their, uh, structured uh, positions, buying and selling different insurance levels, knock in, knockouts, you know, swap, yeah. all these different things. They can put them into a computer program. And, and we, and this is a daily occurrence, every session going in the last half hour, their computer model will spit out what their net equivalent futures position is. Yeah. They're Delta black and Scholes model. And then they can take an offset futures position at the end of the day. So they have a a next to zero risk overnight. And then they can move in and move out as they go. And so then during all this time, they're collecting all the premium. And, you know, statistically, 85% of all the options that ever trade expire worthless. So if I take you to to Vegas and tell you to bet red, 85% of the time you're going to win. Yeah. Well, so, the downside of that is the one, the 15% of time you lose, you'll lose it all, if not right. more. But that's interesting because we talk on this podcast a lot with volatility traders and hedge funds, right? That are always talking about the market makers and the equity index options who yeah. are essentially doing the same thing, right? They have, they're selling all this product. They have a, all of a sudden they have a Delta. They have a gamma. They want to flatten those all out and just earn the, right? Earn the spread on what they buy and sell right. as Collect- a market maker. So they have to, move massively in and out of the market in order to keep their flat right. deltas. They just collect the delta, they collect the, the time value. And what you see every day as we watch again, you know, if, if you see the volume, it's always at the same point, same 20 minutes before the close, the volume peaks as these guys coming in and, and taking the offset every right. single session. That yeah. happens. Do you think a lot of that is totally algorithmic? Oh, without question. Yeah. Without question. That's, it's the same thing when we have a crop report all these computerized trades are, are they're programmed in if this, then that, if this, then that based on usually on supply side or carry out numbers. And we see it as soon as the, the flash out from the USDA, the computers and it, you know, boom, bang, they trade them. And what, and so often in cotton, cause it's a cotton's a screwy commodity. You'll get things that they go back and redo that there's no way to program the what ifs, the, the multiple what ifs. Yeah. If we re, readjust production over the last 10 years in, you know, Pakistan, all these different numbers. So we, every time we get a WASI report, we see the blush reaction to the numbers that the computers generate. And then it's like humans go, well, yeah, but what about that? And the market goes right back to where it's supposed to. Wait, you're saying the USDA report isn't entirely accurate every time? It's not. It's not even close. In fact, that was that was my attempt at sarcasm because it's terrible. Good. I can't even yeah. believe it's like still a thing. It's it's so wrong. Yeah, you know, what I try to say to my guys, I said, look, it by its very nature, it's a look back model, right? It, it's never looking forward. It's only a look back model based Isn't on a it survey. Yes and no. They do. In fact, we had one of our clients. And I'm not. I can't mention names. Got a call from the USDA because he put out his own estimation of the, of the Texas crop, which was a complete defi- absolutely opposite of what the, uh, the USDA had. And they called him and said, where do you come up with these numbers? And he confided in me that he had his own guys out surveying. Mm-hmm. But when he told the USDA, he goes, ah, I know some guys inside your organization. I'm getting, I'm getting the leak. 
<laughs> and they just went nuts. They just went crazy. He was, you know, pulling yeah, away. But anyway, they're look back numbers. And, and what we have to get over is, even though they're look back numbers, they're the only numbers we have for the next 30 days. So we get the next report. And in the past, and it's still it, for the bigger companies, they still have their own guy. I mean, Louis Dreyfus has their own guy that goes out, looks at everything, does all that stuff, and, this, and that does the analysis. And they're way ahead. They're days, months ahead of the USDA. On yeah. this. So, so if you're trading off that as a retail trader, like buyer beware, right? Like it's going to be wrong. There's guys who have known the number, a more accurate number, weeks ahead of you. Right. Um, One of the things I always tell them is, look, the only thing that travels faster than light is money. Yeah. <laughs> so... When you see things happen, the market's already, it already knows it. So yeah. that's, that's one of our, our, you know, rules around here. You've been, we've been talking all this stuff since per pound. So, yeah. right. We're at 90, what are we at? 89 cents per pound. Yeah. 80 right now, the December 89, 20 per pound and, and each, each bale of cotton is uh, statistically 480 pounds, but we running bales 500 pounds for 50,000 pounds in a contract. So, you know, 100 bales and uh, it changed in cents per pound. And, uh, and you said before it's two bales per acre. OK, so for instance, in just it depends on what kind of cotton you're growing. Yeah. Where you're growing and how you're growing. So uh, here in, in, the, in the United States. In the Delta, you know, I'm growing cotton the way my granddaddy did. Don't tell me any different. <laughs> okay, they're they're going to make, you know, two and three quarters to three and a quarter bales per acre. Out here in California, where we used to grow a lot more cotton, but water can make more growing nuts now, we were four, four and a half bales, okay? In Australia, where they've only been growing cotton intensely since the 1960s, they're at six seven bales to the acre wow and it that has more do... water more rain no no it, 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 it's as simple as they don't have to unlearn any bad habits mm. i'll give you one example soil compaction is always a big problem in farming right because once you compact the soil the roots have a hard time finding water nutrients okay in australia when they break new ground using gps they only ever send the wheels across that ground in the same rows ever uh, so, so really the compact soil, these rows. Don't and, touch and, these other rows. Right. And so what they end up with is tremendous root systems that can go down, find nutrients, find water. They're very uh, cognizant and open to innovation. Like I said, they're the ones that went from modules to round bales first. They, they really embrace that. Um, and, and the reason is, I mean, they're 100% export, well, 100%, 99.5% export. I mean, how many, they don't need to spend much cotton in, in there's not that many people. There's more people in LA than in all of Australia. So yeah, exactly. You know, so they it's uh they're an export. You know, they'll do their i their goal every year is five million bales, and their goal is to make five hundred Aussie dollars a bale. Well, this year it looks like even with the flooding they had after half the crop was picked, they're gonna they're gonna do five and a half million, and they're making six seven hundred dollars a bale. They're they're doing fine. So I'd love that the technology piece is that built in. Is that like a John Deere product? Right. Does the tractor know to do that? And the GPS is inside the tractor. Right. Or, right. It's not yeah. quite autonomous, but these guys know where to line up and, and, and stay on that. And that's for all their crops. I mean, they're hmm. just they're, they're, that's just the way that's one of the things. So they're they have a higher yield, you know, in, in countries where they're growing. There's other cottons and people. This is the funny part. Most folks are more informed or well aware of very specialty crop cotton. Like organic, okay. Oh, I organic cotton. That's such a small. It's, it's it's a rounding error in the global production, right? Yeah. Pima cotton is grown in the U.S. exclusively, and it's one of the ELS extra long staple fibers that's grown. Egyptian is the other one. Oh, Egyptian cotton. No, Egyptian yeah, I was going. That was on my list to ask. Yeah. So same yeah. thing. Yeah. So again, that's a marketing play. It seems like yes. Yes. In fact, they've actually. There was a there was a Pima farmer in California that was tired of the additional expense and the reduced yield of growing Pima when it was showing that you know Walmart 
Kmart. Everyone said, well, we got Pima sheets, Pima sheets. And he started adding up. He went out and did this tremendous, and he found that there was a hundred times the amount of Pima product being sold than there was Pima cotton being grown. <laughs> and so he went to his, to his merchant, I'm going to leave the name out of who it was. And they did a study and they found out that this was prevalent throughout the industry. And they went over to China and they found that the opening room had five or six bales of Pima and 200 bales of Indian cotton. And they were blending it, calling it all Pima. Mm-hmm. It's kind what of like the, you can get a Wagyu steak burger at yeah. Burger King or whatever. Yeah. So what happened was then this became an issue and they, the United States has championed the cause to test fiber at the DNA level Whoa. to prove within a square meter of ground where it was grown. So they can go to the Gap or you know, H&M, they can go to a plate, they can get some of that fiber and at a DNA level tell you where that fiber came from. Now here's the backlash, well spun, big Indian, the biggest Indian spinning merchants, they got caught it, saying everything was Pima and it wasn't. And it was such a scandal. All of the U.S. merchant, all the U.S. apparel just turned their back on them and their stock dropped 40% overnight. Whoops. This is going back two, three years. The same situation now exists with Zingyan cotton. They can test to see if Chinese products contain Zingyan fiber, which the world has universally turned its back on. So is there a slave labor work in the fields or whatnot? Right. Yeah. Terrible things that they're claimed. I'm, I'm not going to get involved politically. I've never been there. I, I haven't seen yeah. what's going on. I just know if, if it's bad, it's bad. Yeah. And people don't want to do it. it it's kind of, if you think about it, just philosophically, China's learning how to exist in a capitalistic world. You know, if you're a centralized government, you don't care what other people say. Well, now in capitalism, yeah, people care. Yeah. <laughs> So now they're having to learn how to deal with that. So that that whole thing on the, the Pima cotton spurred this whole DNA study. And the reason Pima cotton, we'll go back to extra long staple, is at a premium. When you make a thread, okay, the longer the fiber, the fewer threads you need to be, to be woven to make that same length, okay? So the lighter the fabric is. So when we think about cotton, there's five characteristics, length, strength, color, micronair, which is how fluffy the thing is in contamination. So those are the things that are very instant when you buy cotton. So India does a very good job now. They're, they're getting with the program on quality. Australia has always been the, the bellwether, really high end. U.S. cotton machine picked, you know, grown. When you irrigate cotton, it grows at a constant, constant rate. When you have rain grown cotton, it grows fast and then slows and grows fast and then slows. So that fiber has different strength points along its mm. length. So in these high-speed mills and the high-speed spinner to try and spin these things, it breaks and it causes neps, which you see on a sweater sometimes. You know, you yeah. get a little fuzzy ball. Yeah. yeah. So these are all things. Neps. Into, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Going into all the, uh, you know, this is going off into the alfalfa of the cotton world. So. So don't overpay for Egyptian cotton, it, but you're saying it is as good. It's just been overmarketed, wow. and you can't really yeah, be sure really, it's pure egyptian cut yeah if you're really getting it you know if you, it, 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 they could put a little bit in it but it won't be 100 and, and and it all boils down to what are you comfortable paying for a shirt i know that the pima sue pima is the organization here in the united states that represents all the pima and they're with you know brooks brothers and with the high end they do assure that this is all really on the on the up and up and they, they go to great lengths to prove that and it's a great product there, there's no question it's just the other guys that are trying to get the premium without really putting the real deal in there. And what are your thoughts? It seems to me like more and more of my clothing, right? Lululemon or like, I don't have a hundred percent cotton golf shirt anymore. Right. It's all this performance right. type shirt that feels better to me. So is that going to eventually take over or we're always going to have cotton? We can't just make this stuff pure artificially. Right. Like I, I think, I What's think the, the, end awareness, game? the awareness of the microfiber, the microfiber plastic, microplastic pieces is really going to push towards natural fiber. Now, again, that could be more hemp. Uh, that could be, you know, a greater reliance on bamboo. You know, I love, I've got a few bamboo sh- shirts. I love them. Some bamboo right. underwear. Woo, it's comfy. Yeah. <laughs> so there, there, there's going to be that. But along the way, cotton, because it is an efficient, uh, 
people always, this is the big argument I always get with these knuckleheads in agriculture. Oh, cotton's a thirsty crop. It uses too much water. Yeah, but most of it comes from the sky. You know, so yeah. you know, cotton will always be grown because it can be irrigated for free. So the cost of production is more determined on a rain grown crop by diesel, fertilizer, and then pesticide herbicides and go through all the list. But that's why now, you know, normally in the Delta, Delta states, you know, their cost of production is figured at 70 to 75 cents a pound. But today for next year's crop, uh, we were talking with some Delta farmers last week, it's a dollar seven. And that's the fertilizer, which we have supply chain issues, Russian issues and diesel additive. Right. So, you know, that the, the question then begs to be answered, well, the dollar seven, and I'm looking at next year's, the red deck, the December 23 crop right now is priced at uh, 75 cents. How much cotton are you going to plant if it costs a dollar seven to grow and you only get 75 cents? So low prices will cure low prices as assuredly as high prices cure high prices. Yeah. So what, so what do they do instead? They'll plant soybeans or something? Right now, yeah, the ratio, when I look at the ratio of the uh, new crop soybeans to new crop cotton is now at 16.4, as opposed to the like this November and this December, the ratio is 14.8. We're at 16.5, 16, which heavily favors producing soybeans that don't require, you know, they're a, nit they're a legume. They fix nitrogen in the soil. They don't, you don't have to put nitrogen fertilizer in. So that's what behooves the, the soybean production, you know, for the new crop we'll, we'll, we'll plant, you know, in the fall. What, what happens, going a little off topic here, what happens when diesel's so expensive that, like, basically it makes all cost of production anything right if there's no elasticity between crops because whether i plant soybeans or whatever right i my input costs are way too much to make any money so i, I just don't want to plant anything that that's at the crux of what a lot of these uh you know futurist and macro thought uh, leaders are considering is that human nature well it's not it's just it's, it's economics if i'm a, a corn producer a wheat grower a soybean grower and i can't afford the inputs i just won't input them so you're going to see global yields decline, right? You don't get the optimal return out of the soil. And, and what you are seeing, and, I, and we're seeing it here, maybe it's just because California were fruits and nuts, but one of the strengths, what we're seeing here to this day, as we speak, I had a guy in here yesterday, they, they have a biological product that when you, and it, and it comes from worm castings. And when you take this fluid in a drip system, it releases the stored mineral capacity in the soil. So you don't have to, not only do you not have to apply fertilizer, you're liberating it from the soil hmm. where over the years, you know, guys fertilize, 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 fertilize. Well, what they found is you can, you can cut your fertilizer cost in half and put this, this uh, excrement from the worm casting. It's, a, it's made a tea not only do you replicate, do you get more out of the soil, but your yields go up. And what worm casting? We're talking worm shit? Yeah, exactly. It's uh, <laughs> vermiculture. They, they rebranded it to worm casting. So what they do is they take these, these long um, you know, vats, if you will, of uh, organic cow manure from the organic dairies here. And then the top foot and a half are all the worms. And they pile the stuff on them. And the, what comes down out of the bottom, they eventually cut off. Yeah. They take this... Uh, mulch and they steep a tea water through it and then all those nutrients you know you were a kid they always said oh, worms are good for the soil yeah well what they're good for the soil is now in this liquid form and when that goes into the soil there'll be two or three hundred different antibiotic breakdowns uh, that, that go into the soil and release and make the uh, nutrients available to the roots of plants in the soil that already is there without any additives. It's also, it's, it's a drought, they're, they're better in the drought. There's all kinds of sea yields. They get a longer shelf life, more flavor to the, to the fruits. And where they initially started was in the cannabis industry because they found that with a uh, 50 cents worth of this product onto the cannabis crop, they made 64 more dollars in yield. So 50 cents in, $64 out, that's, that's a pretty good ratio. And then it grew into the strawberries, where it's a very high dollar 
you can't pick crops. So the same type of results. So now all of a sudden the grape guys, right? The wine guys who have big margins. Yeah, that they're nice? realizing that when they plant grapes, it's normally a five year wait for a, for a crop to pick. It's down to three. That's how fast the root systems expand with these products. So we're getting innovation along those lines. Yeah. So. And then to me, you were always like, like you said, s- satellites eventually will have electric tractors and whatnot. Right. Well, um, there's, there's actually out here for spraying uh, almond trees, which is a big industry out here now. It's autonomous. These machines come out of the barn. They spray what they're supposed to autonomously, no human involved, and they come back and park themselves in the barn. Yeah. Almonds. We, I knew a guy once had run some hedge funds, made a bunch of money, and then he bought almond farms. He's like, oh, I make 10 times what I made in the hedge fund world oh, on absolutely. these almond farms. Right. Um, it all comes down out here to what can you convert a drop of water into? It's the, the, the greatest percentage return with the exception of if you go to a, a, a permanent, if you will, they call them permanent improvements, trees, an almond tree has about a 20, 20 year span before the production level you know, breaks down, they have to replace. So what happens if you go ahead and you're five years, six years into it, and then you get your water cut off? Mm. Well, so then the, the, the idea is that, well, I'll have some of my crops in permanent, but then I'll be row crops, you know, tomatoes uh, out here is the big thing, you know, for, for that cotton's really suffered acreage wise. But, uh, and I, I probably not too far of a stretch to see California be like no more almonds takes too much water. It's bad for the, bad for the earth. Yeah. You know, I could see that but again, a lot of the, a lot of the rain. Yeah. The almonds require this much water, but a lot of it comes from rain. Okay. So then <laughs> what's your argument? Yeah. I mean, that gets glossed over when people are like almonds use too much water. Right. It right. takes such and such water to grow in almonds. Right. And but that's comes out of the sky. It, it's the same argument with, with beef production. Oh, it takes so much water. Well, most of the time the cows are eating stuff that people can't eat anyway, and off of acreage that nobody's going to cultivate anyway. So it's yes, this is the re, the caloric requirement. My degree is in livestock production management from UC Davis. And so I have an intimate understanding of the conversion process. And it's if you're going to have a bunch of rangeland that's either going to catch on fire or be grazed down by cattle, where's the downside in grazing the cattle on? Yeah, which would you prefer? Speaking of UC Davis, when I was just there in your area and talking with a friend and he was kind of lamenting all the pros coming out of UC Davis that become the winemakers and all they're doing is like going down the same lane all growing these big, bold calves, right? Ripping out other vines to plant cab vines. Like what's your, any thoughts on that? And he was kind of saying there's, they become so good. UC Davis has taught them so well and all the tricks of the trade that it's like, there's not much variation between years anymore. And it's just becoming like one taste. He was yeah. kind of like, what's the fun in that? But I don't, what are your thoughts? It's just, I, yeah. Going to Davis, you know, I, I play football, baseball, and rugby there, and a bunch of my teammates were viticulturists and get to know them, and eventually I, you know, stay in touch with them, and they're all big wine guys now. I mean, the biggest. Yeah. And so you talk to these guys. and Vengi? What was the one I said? Oh, Bungi? Uh, you mean, uh, oh, Gun Like Bunchu? No, Kurt Vengi, I think his name is. Oh, Vengi? Okay, yeah, yeah. Some of these guys, you got to remember, if you go back when we were at Davis, they were just coming to understand the science of the art. Prior to the 1970s, if you knew how to make wine, you were you were a, a real princely guy to make good wine, and a lot of it was not good wine. Yeah. In fact, um, one of the, the bunch uh, Gunlock Bunchu Winery is the oldest winery here, and you know they lost a million cases of wine in the San Francisco earthquake in 1906. Okay. Wow. So when you talk to the family, old Jimmy Bunchu, he says, "Yeah, you know when 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 prohibition ended." I went to the family and said, we got to go start growing grapes again and get out of those plums and pears and things that they've gone in. And these guys would meet every morning at this little coffee shop here in town. And they go, Hey, uh, which grapes are you going to grow? I'm going to try that, that chard chardonnay. Oh, I'm going (laughs) to go with that. I'm going to try that peanut, that peanut, (laughs) you know, and that boiner and all that. They didn't even know how to say the words. They just knew that, that there was some good returns in it. So they started growing something that became very popular. Right. Yeah. And they're but just farmers at the end of the day, right? It's, that's exactly it. That's exactly the, to the to the very day, and the and the bunches are classic. You know, they, I, they we got great stories about them. The, when um, 
It's a great name, Bunchu. You unlike Bunchu, right? So Jimmy Bunchu, when Virgin Atlantic first flew into San Francisco, they had a big opening, a big fancy deal, and Bronson um, was going to come up and taste wine. He had a bus, and it was his mom and all the celebrities, and they were supposed to go to Napa, where you had just gone. And he was following the bus in his helicopter. Well, Jim Bunchu goes down and gets a uh, CHP uniform from a costume store, <laughs> takes a motorcycle out and makes the bus. He stops it and says, you're not, we're not going to subject you to drinking these terrible Napa wines. You're going to come drink Sonoma wines and has them redirected to his winery in Sonoma. <laughs> okay. So he's done other stunts like this, like he held up the wine train. And anyway, so what happens is here's, here's <laughs> the helicopter's flying. He's supposed to go this way. And all of a sudden there goes the bus with his mom in it. Mm-hmm. And Branson's just panicked, panicked. Anyway, they find, they land, they find and By the time they get there, everybody was having a great time drinking Sonoma wines. And, the, and his mother was quoted in the BBC as saying, these are the nicest people I've ever met in California. <laughs> So there's that that Sonoma attitude of a bunch of old school guys that, you know, they're farmers. Uh, they just happen to farm something that became real popular. They're always looking for a varietal. I don't know if you how much you know about wine. I'll bore you with a million stories. But you know that movie Sideways? Yeah. OK, well, it turned everybody off from Merlot, which right. is old. That's an old that's an old country wine. Merlot is like a, a Bordeaux, right? It's things that are very mild and constant everyday drinking. And guys had to pull all their vines out because nobody would pay them for it. So you see that type of thing happening quite a bit. Um, there is that common thought, you know, the common thought of I learned how to make wine at Davis or, or, or Fresno State. That's the other big one. And this is how we're going to make it. But what you see are guys are changing over in, in different boutique areas where they're going to more of the, uh, you know, the, the old school European flavors, you know, the Rhone varieties, different things. And you're seeing a little experimentation, but, you know, there's so much production. People want the wine that, you know, you yeah. produce what you make. So, give them, give anyway. them what they want. Yeah. wrap it up here what are your give me uh your hottest take on cotton or wine or whatever you got i'll take it no i'll just i'll, I'll stick with cotton that's what we do best the uh i think with the uh right now we're in an environment so the bull market's not over forever it's just over for now and you know inflationary uh in, macro inflationary efforts you know, no one really wants to be short anything because you just don't know what inflation is going to do to it so there's a reluctance to buy and then in absence of buyers, the market can continue to go down. And it's going to drop until one of two things happens. To me, it's, 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 it's a very simple, simple dis- discussion here. You're either going to reach an undervalued level where the conversion allows the trade to make a fundamental decision. Okay, this is cheap enough that I can buy it, convert it, and make a profit. Okay, then you'll see them come into the market. Or... Two, you reach a technical level where the money managers, speculators, magically delicious decide this is where we want to own it. Okay. Yeah. And I don't know if you want to look at, you know, uh, some type of moving average, a Fibonacci number, something will happen that you'll get a, a buying force into the market. And in and, and a lack of selling, it doesn't take a whole lot of buying to stabilize and then drive the market back up. So right now we're in a, in a kind of, not for now, but wait a minute type of environment. The market will calm. The volatility values, God, they're 44%. Normally we're 18 to 20. Yeah. We're 44% fall. It'll calm down. The cotton, the cotton VIX. You got, you got yeah. a word for that? The <laughs> cotton VIX is at 44. It's, it's, it's a mess. So we'll get the emotion out of the market. I still think there's probably a problem that we don't not aware of in, in China economically that that's weighing on the market um i will tell you that the hedge funds that we dealt with over the last 18 months were gaming in the russia you know ukraine deal and made tons of money on the market yeah. and uh so there's there's always those guys like you said you know the smartest guys out there they're, they're out there running with the money so then that's that's what's going to drive it so that's where i think yeah I think the cta is we track right the trend following guys act actually now flat they're not short yet. 
uh, some very short term guys might be short, but uh, on the whole, they're just flat right now. Yeah, um, the, the growers are not short because they don't know what their crop is. We had we had a Texas farmer, you know, this guy's got 5,000 acres. He thought he was 20% hedged, but because of the failure of the crop, he was 60% hedged. You know, I don't know. I mean, all of a sudden, not yeah. because he changed his position, it's just because he didn't have the crop, right? So the, it, there's just, there's not a lot of appetite to go short anything from either a macro economic perspective or a micro production perspective. So it's going to be, you know, go up slow, come down fast, shoots and ladders. We've already had a dead cat bounce. That was, it just happened. Now the market's coming Last back. Last week, yeah. Yeah, 80 cents. If you had to pick a number, put a gun to my head, be patient, wait for 80. Uh, there's there's a chart gap too that has to be filled. But, you know, 80 cents to me might might be the extent of this thing. And uh, at least it's a lower risk approach. And what, what's your cotton informed view of we're going into recession? The Fed will keep hiking, stop I think, hiking. I think we're in recession and all the numbers are looked back and we don't get them until a month later, a quarter later, et cetera. Um, I don't think it's going to be long lived. Um, you know, one of the unintended consequences of lower interest rates with so much money around. And, you know, we all are appalled, appalled that you have to get a 4% home loan. Oh, my yeah. God. Un-American. Right. Yeah, the first lot. I remember the first house I bought. I was, I thought I was I, giggling. I made eleven. I got eleven percent. That was great. Yeah. So we'll get the growth back. We got to get over the shock. I, I think there's, you know, there's still health questions. Will China shut down? Will the supply chain get un, unwound? We all have to deal with this. It's the noise that we live in now. So you just have to look past the uh, the screaming heads on TV and uh, look at facts. It looks at numbers. Um, I always say that, you know, the only, the only guy that really knows what cotton's worth is Charles chart. <laughs> the chart knows. And yeah. Charlie, the price Charlie knows. knows. That's it. That's it. So anyway, that's uh, what. I'm awesome. Well, tell everyone where they can find you, where they can sign up for that newsletter. Um, all that good stuff. Yeah. Logicadvisors.com. It's uh, Lawson O'Neill, global institutional commodity advisors, but logic, uh, logic, advisors.com uh we we try to post some stuff now and again on uh, linkedin uh to try and you know chum the waters get people interested um our letter the way we write the letter is we expect you to understand some of the stuff that that's common knowledge and so we write it from that perspective and we realize that everyone that has any interest in this has got a ton of stuff to read every day yeah so we make it one page one page. If I can't get what across when I'm trying to get one page, I, you know, I, one of my clients says it's his, it's his perfect after lunch reading when he goes to the men's room. <laughs> one, one page, he gets it done. The trick is we write the letter and then I put a headline in that pertains to something within the letter. And the game is you have to figure out when it says, you know, three strikes, you're out. You got to figure out what I am talking about as you right. read the letter. It makes What's, you, it forces you to get to the end. I love so it. that's a little hook. It's a, it's a trick I learned from a guy named Herb Kane that used to write here in the, in the San Francisco Chronicle for, he was a legend for years. So it's just something, you know, just a little game. If you can figure it out, that's good. Um, there's a lot of bad puns and, and rock and roll lyrics so that you understand it. And uh, yeah. that's the way to do it. it. Um, awesome. Ron, well, it's been fun. Thanks so much for the, download on all things cotton i appreciate it all right sounds um, good we will talk to you soon and next time i'm out there gonna stop by hope you do we'll meet for a beer at, at uh ernie's that sounds great have a good summer you too thanks ron all right bye-bye you've been listening to the derivative links from this episode will be in the episode description of this channel follow us on twitter at rcm alts and visit our website to read our blog or subscribe to our newsletter at rcmalts.com. If you liked our show, introduce a friend and show them how to subscribe. And be sure to leave comments. We'd love to hear from you. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of RCM Alternatives, their affiliates, or companies featured. 
Due to industry regulations, participants on this podcast are instructed not to make specific trade recommendations nor reference past or potential profits. And listeners are reminded that managed futures, commodity trading, and other alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors.